Today, we talk about how podcasting actually works, whether or not you're ready for one, and how to use a podcast to grow your brand. Take it away, Nicole. Have you ever listened to an interview and the person says something interesting and an interviewer doesn't go dig into that? I'm convinced that's why Oprah is at the top of her game. Because if you say something interesting to Oprah, she's not going to let it go. She's going to dig into that because she is naturally a curious person. And so I try to emulate Oprah and be naturally curious because I think she's one of the best interviewers in the world. And the reason she is, is because she just herself is fascinated with the person that is in front of her. Hey there, I'm Jason Logston, and this is Making Bacon, all about helping you serve your fans, grow your income, and get the most out of your blog. As bloggers, we always hear that you need to be everywhere. So we write on our blogs, we post on Facebook and Instagram, we share images on Pinterest, and even post videos on YouTube. But one area most bloggers neglect is audio. Over the last decade, podcasting has exploded, and many experts think it will continue to grow in the future. But just how do you get started in podcasting? There's so many unknowns, it can be really intimidating, but today's guest is going to share her expertise and get us all set up for success. She's a home chef and food enthusiast who celebrates with her stomach and travels with her taste buds. On the BFF with the Chef podcast, she aims to help people benefit from the knowledge she seeks out every day, bringing them the very best inspiration, guidance, and tips from the chefs and culinary professionals she admires. Today, she's coming on to talk about podcasting, podcasting, and podcasting. I can't wait to learn from Nicole Schwegman, the creator and host of the BFF with the Chef podcast. Nicole, welcome to Making Bacon. Hey, thanks for having me. Oh, I'm excited to be on a podcast that's called Making Bacon, because you know how much I love bacon. I do. I know you love it. <laughs> uh, it's really... ridiculous. It's awesome. <laughs> I'm so excited to have you on because I really believe that podcasting is a natural extension for a lot of bloggers for to expand their reach and grow their brand. It's a different medium, but it's still just telling a story and making your fans visualize something that you want them to visualize. So I can't wait to hear what you have to share about it. But first, I always like to start with, what is it like around your dinner table on a typical day? Oh, man. You know, that's interesting. So typically, it's just me. Um, around my dinner table. And you know what? I have this philosophy. I once heard this story about Nancy Myers. And Nancy Myers, she's a director. She makes all those great like movies like Something's Gotta Give. It's always like, you know, some movie involves a woman. I love that. And she's usually an older woman doing something. And I'll tell you something about Nancy Myers. Man, every every kitchen in her in her movie house that she has for that fictional character is amazing like it's just the most beautiful kitchen ever and so the reason nancy myers is always so attentive to that is because when she was just starting out like she would make herself like a full dinner like a roast chicken with potato the whole nine right it would almost be like a dinner for a family of four and she would eat it right and it was just like her way of like you know i don't know like given it to the patriarchy. And so <laughs> I often live alone. And so I, a typical like night around my dinner table, I'm not doing that whole eating a sandwich over the sink. No, I will make myself a full out meal because I, I think it's important to nourish yourself. And I think there's something just real empowering about making your own food and not just making like SpaghettiOs out of a can, y'all. I'm talking about no kidding, last night I made a ribeye steak in the air fryer. One of the bloggers who came on my podcast taught me how to do that. It's a real fast and easy way to get a steak on your table. And you know what? I just had some uh, broccoli to go along with it. Um, but that was a simple meal, but it's still a full on meal for me. There's something nice about cooking for yourself sometimes that it's you just make exactly what you want and don't have to worry about anyone else's tastes or concerns and you can just do whatever you want, which can be really nice. Absolutely. And you know, I tell people, look, I mean, if you're eating spaghetti out of the can, no shame, no judgment, you know, do you. But I feel like one of the ways, especially because I'm in the Navy and for many years I deployed on ships and I didn't get it. I didn't get the opportunity to make my own food. I had to eat what was made, which God bless them. They do a great job with trying to feed us, but there's nothing like cooking a meal for yourself. So it's always been a privilege and a pleasure for me to make dinner for myself. And I really do try to like take the opportunity, especially because I'm about to move. I'm not going to be able to do that for another 
month now and I'm going to miss it. So I always try to make an actual no kidding dinner for myself with like, you know, three, you know, two sides, meat, three, you know, <laughs> and that sort of thing. But yeah, that's my typical dinner table. I love that. I think that's great. Just because when you're eating by yourself, you don't have to just eat you know, SpaghettiOs in a can, unless that's your choice, and then yep. more power to you. <laughs> exactly. Somebody right now screaming in their car going, I like SpaghettiOs. I'm like, we know. Yep. <laughs> We're not There's talking to you. <laughs> nothing wrong with making a package of Kraft mac and cheese and eating the entire thing by yourself. That is an acceptable not dinner at sometimes. All. <laughs> maybe throw a little bit if you want to take it up a notch, throw a bit of little buttered, you know, breadcrumbs on top, maybe yep. pop it in an oven for a few seconds just to crisp it on, you know, just whatever. Little just Trader little bit, Joe's. Maybe a little like in there. <laughs> Maybe a little bacon, a little everything, you know, uh, 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 bagel seasoning from Trader Joe's, you know, whatever suits your fancy. It doesn't matter. It's a meal. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I like about you is that you're very upfront about where you, how you got into podcasting and blogging and kind of your approach to everything. You're, you're very honest about it, which I love. So you were hosting the Everything Food Conference Happy Hour. You did an amazing job just there for an hour talking to people, you know, commenting on Facebook, basically. <laughs> and you shared your origin story. And I thought it was great because it's not like as a little girl, you always wanted to start a podcast. And this was your dream job. Can you talk about how you got into podcasting? Oh, for sure. Because about to, you know, lay some truths on people. <laughs> so <laughs> back in 2018, let's go back to January of 2018. And I thought to myself, man, I need a hobby. And uh, my only hobby is stuff in my face. And I love food. It's always been like, it's always been a constant in my life. Like I said, I'm in the military. I've loved serving um, the nation. It's been an honor. But, you know, one of the things, the sacrifices that you give up, the one, you know, I always talk about sacrifices can be big, small. One of the small sacrifices you give up is the ability to always make your own food, which is important to me. And so whenever I was deployed or I, I was somewhere I couldn't cook, you know, I always looked forward to getting back to my kitchen. So I thought, ah, I'm stable for a couple of years in one place. I need a hobby. I'm going to start a food blog. So I like, you know, I buy a domain name, like I start a website and I'm like, all right, I'm starting a food blog. And about a month later, I was like, oh, this is too hard. <laughs> <laughs> all the food bloggers are right now are going, amen. Like, <laughs> I just, I gave up. Because apparently, you know, to start a food blog, you actually have to have recipes you want to share and you got to take pictures. You gotta t oh, my gosh. It's like just too much. I don't know how you do it, man. Like, <laughs> I was just like, oh, forget it. Also, I don't have any new ways to share buffalo chicken dip. Like, I just I just got no original recipes. I just, you know, find other people's recipes and use them. So I thought to myself, I, I got I got nothing. I got no grandma's recipes. She worked her whole life. So did my mom. Like we got no family recipes. <laughs> my mom right now is disowning me. She's like, we have one. No. <laughs> and so I gave up on my blog, but I felt bad about it because I thought I got this cool domain name and I really wanted to do something. And it turns out I was like, so what am I good at? And at the time I was listening to a ton of podcasts. Like they just, I listen to them while I'm folding my laundry, while I'm driving to work. Like they were just like that thing that I was really into. And also, um, I like to talk. If you can't tell by now, I'm like a Michael Jordan. They should do like a last, you know, chat, like documentary with me. You know, the last dance with him. I should be like the last chat because I will chat the heck out of somebody. I love to talk. That used to be, I think I remember in my, on my, um, permit my slips home they'd be like nicole is very bright but she talks a lot or cannot stop talking during class that's me i was that girl okay you know who that girl was me <laughs> and so i love to chat it up usually about nothing just chit, chit, chit. that's what that's what an instructor once said to me me i'm like chit, 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 and got nothing to say well i did have something to say about food and so i thought well i like food I like talking. I'm going to combine these together into a podcast show. And so I worked on it like throughout the summer. I will tell you that I like I got the idea in June, but I didn't launch until September. And 50% was because I had never launched a podcast. And it turns out they're actually quite a lot of work. Uh, <laughs> go figure. Just as much as the food blog, except instead of taking pictures, it's all talking, 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 which is a little easier for me because that's my gift. 
Um, and the other 50% was fear. Like I was terrified to ask people to be on my podcast. I mean, it was just, it's like, think about that time where you had a crush on somebody and you thought, should I ask him out? Well, multiply it by five. And that's what it's like to ask the first guest to be on your podcast. That's why, you know, I, I, it took me till September to launch. Um, but I launched and I haven't looked back since. Okay, maybe a little bit of looking back, but mostly I've just kept going forward. <laughs> <laughs> so your podcast is focused on, I think you phrase it as trying to unite a community of like-minded enthusiasts to you know, move beyond the recipes, just following recipes. How did you settle on that topic? And did you go through a few different variations? Or how do you, how do you recommend someone choose a topic for their podcast? Well, so I had help. Again, I'm not going to just sit here and tell you like, because I think a lot of times like when you hear an original, like an origin story, people are like, and I was in my garage and I just started tinkering and stuff. And that's like never really quite it. Right. Yes, I did think about starting a podcast. I knew I wanted to start one, but I worked with um, a company called Cook It Media um, and they have actually been interviewed on Food Blogger Pro um, uh, and and what they do um, is they're kind of like a food blogger branding company where they help food bloggers figure out their brands. And they had this service where you could chat with them for an hour and explain what you were trying to do. And from your conversation, they would help you. It was almost like they were the food blog whisperer. They could help you <laughs> refine and hone your brand. And I have a PR background, so I know how important it is to, to make your brand understandable from the very beginning, right? People don't do well with ambiguity. If you're like, oh, I'm a food blog, but I'm also gonna like do crafts, but I'm also gonna talk about my travels, but I'm also gonna, like, people are like, what are you about? You know, like maybe like back when Angel Fire was a thing, you could do that. But nowadays you can't, you have to have a pretty specific brand. And so I knew like from day one, people needed to understand what am I about? Like why? Why am I talking into the ether, right? And they should at least be able to understand me. So I, I worked with them and they helped me like when I, just all the things I was talking about and I was just all over the place, right? It was like, I was like, bah, bah, bah. Uh, all right. And so, and so the food media folks were like, is this what you want? And I was like, yeah, that's exactly what I want. And so that's how, you know, I came to be, oh, I am a, I want a, a community of like-minded enthusiasts because the thing is, is, I'm never gonna be a chef. Chef's life is hard and I'm soft and I know that about myself. And food blogger life is also hard and I got no patience. Like, I just wanna eat the food. Like, I, the reason I really failed at being a food blogger is because you're supposed to be able to like, take a picture of the food, you know, make it look pretty. Uh, and maybe after it's all cold, you might get a chance to try it. And I'm just like, got no discipline for that. Gotta eat it right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> the best I can do is take like Instagram videos of while I'm making it. But yeah, no, it's getting devoured immediately into my face. So uh, they were able to parse out that brand for me because like I said, branding is so important to what you're you're going to do. And, and that's kind of how I came up with that is me throwing a bunch of stuff on the wall and then scraping it off and going, we think you mean this. And I was like, that's exactly what I mean. You know, you've been through that where you're trying to like explain something and someone's like, do you mean this? And you're like, yes. <laughs> and, and, and that's how I came up with my brand is I had help. And so I want to say to people out there who are considering like whether you're on your blog, like you don't have to do it all yourself. Just like I advocate for buy pre-cut vegetables. If that's what's going to get you in a kitchen cooking, buy pre-cut vegetables, you know, buy pre-cut meat. Like if you just all to dump it in a pot, you know, to get yourself started, you don't have to do it all yourself as a food blogger, a podcaster, ask for help. If you can afford help, ask for help. And if you can't, what I also recommend is there are like all these like branding worksheets on the internet that help you like define what your brand is so that if you let's say you're just like, girl, I got no money to be like hiring a branding expert. I would say if you plan on making this your business, then yeah, you do. You know, you need to maybe save for a couple of months, but but do it. And and the next thing I would tell you is, is that if you can't afford that, get some type of branding sheet and walk through and define yourself. 
what are you about when people when you tell people you know even your your i give my five second spiel you know bff the chef is a podcast that aims to make you a better home cook by talking to chefs and food bloggers about the things they're cooking and eating in their kitchen boom that's exactly you know as an audience member what you're going to get from me and you should be able to articulate that because as you go along what i have found is that people will reach out to me like sponsors and other you know uh, uh media type folks and I need to be able to quickly tell them, you know, in an elevator ride, what is my podcast? I can't tell you how many times I've been hanging out with somebody and someone's like, oh, you know, she has a podcast. And you're like, oh, what's your podcast about? Boom. You know, you should be able to immediately say what your blog or your podcast is about in one sentence. And that's your brand. So that's I got help with that, though. And I am a professional. I do that for other people. You don't have to do it yourself. Get help. I think that's so important to know exactly what you stand for and to be able to articulate it. A lot of people, you say, oh, what do you do? And it's a five minute kind of meandering thing about, and you come away with like, so food kind of? Yeah. And then I'm like, I'm out. And then, and then people are like, oh, that's a hobby, not a business. Right. Yeah. So if you take more than like, if you're not like super laser focused on like what you're about, I can tell you whenever somebody tells me they're like, I asked someone once there, I was like, Oh, you know, you're a, you're a businessman. What do you do? And he's like, Oh, well, you know, I own a club, but you know, it's also like a community center, but it's also like, you know, a daycare, but it's also like, you know, a nightclub, but also sometimes it's a restaurant. I'm like, what, what is this? Like, like immediately I'm like, I'm not going, I'm not going to take my, I'm not going to take children there. I'm not going to drink there. And I'm absolutely not going to eat there. Like it's too many things like, you know, fo focus down because I'm, I, then I think you're not very, either not, you're not very good at any of those things or you don't know how to be concise. And if you can't be concise with your words and you can't be concise with your food. So <laughs> yep. and yeah. you can practice it really easily. Like you said, you can go get help, which is a great thing to do. And while you're trying to narrow it down, you can even just go to your friends in the middle of a conversation and be like, hey, can I have two minutes of your time? I'm going to tell you what I do and you let me know what you take out of it and if it makes sense and give them your pitch. And at first it'll be like, I know what you do and I don't understand what you just told me. You know, mm -hmm. And then you can narrow it and hone it down until people will understand what, what you have and you get used to just rattling it off and then it feels very natural. Yeah, P simplicity is key. It needs to be, you need to be able to, a 10-year-old should be able to, like, get what you do. Like, they may not understand all of it, but they can repeat it back to you. If it's yeah. too hard for a 10-year-old to tell you, too, too, too long. <laughs> yeah, you need to focus yeah. on your main one or two things, and that's it. And because it's yeah. not the end of a conversation, it's, if you do it right, it's going to open up a conversation. And then you can talk about the nightclub speakeasy that you have above the daycare in the middle of the night right but you don't need to lead with that <laughs> exactly otherwise it's like don't go there <laughs> <No>. <laughs> all the kids are little waiters it's it's a beautiful thing i know but... it's like oh we came up with the yeah no it's like you know, i'm not going there i'm out <laughs> <laughs> So there's lots of different types of podcasts. There's interview podcasts like this one, and that's what you do as well. There's host on the mic podcasts where it's one person, almost like a radio show, just talking. And there's more produced ones that are more like stories and storytelling. How did you decide on doing an interview style? Well, so I did some research. And while I can talk a lot, I mean, we saw that during the Facebook Live that I can literally talk for an hour without anyone talking back. I felt that was going to get old pretty quickly. You Generally, people, it's hard to listen to one person talk unless they are giving you actionable advice immediately. So a good example of someone who does a great podcast like that is a guy named Ken page and he does a deeper dating podcast. I know it's not related to food. People are like, what? But the reason I say check out his podcast is not so much for his content, but the fact of how he does it. So, so Ken is a therapist and what he's doing is he's giving advice to people, right? Like his whole topic is advice. And so it's a, it's probably about 20 minutes per podcast, you know, cause that's really about what people can stand if you're just by yourself. And it's all actionable advice. Like he'll explain something to you and then he'll give you 
advice on actionable things to take out of it. And so you can do that, but the, you know, my topic didn't really lend towards that because again, I don't have a whole lot of advice to give people. And I find that most people don't. Generally, the people who can do a solo podcast are people who are like therapists or they're people who are technicians who have instructions they're trying to give you, be it for life or how to like, you know, make a bird, you know, a bird cage or how to train your puppy. That's how that's actionable advice. And people will only take that for about 20 minutes, right? That's about how long you can go before people tune you out or they're just like, oh, this is boring. You know, having a, I find that when you have a, um, or you have to be very famous, right? Like I might listen to Cher talk, you know, for for 30 minutes about anything, but she's Cher. You know? <laughs> I'm not going to listen to some random, you know, person that I don't know talk about Oh, and then I took the dog for a walk. I mean, I listen, that's an AMSR podcast, and that's a completely different kind of thing. Um, so the second type of podcast, of course, um, is an interview podcast. And I find that those are better because you have interaction between people, right? And then there's two types of interview podcasts, or there's several, but the two I normally hear is one is like you interview a person about their life and how they got started in their career and blah, blah, blah. And the second one is you're interviewing a person who's an expert and you are helping the audience as the conduit. Like you're the stand in for the audience. You know, you assume the audience doesn't know that much as the host. You act like you don't know a lot, even if you do, because you are asking the questions that are on the audience's mind. And that's the approach I tend to take. I, I kind of mash them up a little bit. I do want to know where people started from because I think it inspires people to hear, oh no, these people are just like you, right? Like, and a lot of people have a dream of becoming a chef or starting their own food blog. And it's always great for them to hear how it got started. But then this is BFF with the chef. And one of the things is we talk about people making people better home cooks. You can only become a better home cook if you hear about what people are talking about, uh, who are what they're eating and what they're cooking and how they're doing it. So that's why I always tend to try to make people get into the recipes and walk us through it. Like, let's talk about this. Okay, let's talk about that technique. Or what, you meshed peas and like sugar together? What are you, crazy? Like, no, no one's ever done that, by the way. That's gross. Uh, <laughs> but, but if they did, I would make them walk me through why did they do that? Because people are trying to learn something and I'm acting as the audience like, I don't understand what's going on. So explain this to me because I want to know. You ever listen to an interview and the person says something interesting and the interview doesn't go dig into that? I'm convinced that's why Oprah is at the top of her game. Because if you say something interesting to Oprah, she's not going to let it go. She's going to dig into that because she wants to, as she is naturally a curious person. And so I try to emulate Oprah and be naturally curious because I think she's one of the best interviewers in the world. And the reason she is, is because she just herself is fascinated with the person that is in front of her. And I am always fascinated. One of the best things about doing a podcast is I am truly fascinated by every person who's come on my podcast. There's not one person that came on that podcast that I didn't think was the most interesting person in the world. I'm like, wow, I know there's all these people in the world that are so incredible and amazing. And every single person, Every single one, I can say that without a doubt, is one of the most interesting people I've ever met, and I've learned so much from them. So I, I, I think that people hear that in my voice, and that makes it more interesting, and you can take that format out a little bit longer. So I love that idea of being curious, and it's something that I try to do in my interviews, and it's so important to you know just not have a list of questions that you're going to read and you know, the, the the person being interviewed says something interesting. It's like, great, but my next question is this. And it's right. like, but I wanted, I want to hear more about that. What was that? And so. Exactly. Exactly. Plus it sounds weird. It's like, what are you, a Stepford, like, you know, interviewer, yeah. like, come on, I have a personality. And I, I, I oftentimes people are ask me when I, when I, I send them a list of interview questions, but I warn them like, you know, I'm not going to really stick to that. That's just so you feel good, but don't, I'm like, don't like sit there and write out answers to each of those questions. I've had people try to do that. And then they're 
wait, like, but I wrote all these. I'm like, oh, you did homework? I told you not to do homework. Like, <laughs> <laughs> don't do homework because you're just going to be naturally interesting because of who you are. And I will tell you that there are people who are like, I'm actually not that interesting. And I would say I disagree. Everybody in the world is interesting. Everybody has everybody has a unique way of doing something. Uh, I've not met one person who doesn't have one killer cooking tip. You know, even if this person burns water, they know how to find the best sandwiches in the city. Like they have something that's related to food that's a killer tip. And so I, I would implore everybody, you are more unique and special and interesting than you think you are. You know, I didn't think I was very special. And then uh, every time I try to end this podcast, people, someone will say, I love your podcast. And I'm like, no, <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely an interesting experience interviewing people and talking to them and trying to dive in and people will be like, well, I don't know if I have much to share. And it's like, like I interview kidding? a lot of food bloggers. I'm like, you have a food blog that, you know, 10 X its traffic over the last year and you think you don't have anything to share to all the other food bloggers. I'm like, I've been food blogging for 10 years and I want to talk to you and hear what you did, much less it's someone that's so just getting started. Funny. I don't have a lot to share. I only just like have a million followers and, you know, oh, I'm not that interesting. I'm like, you started. Do you, do you know any people just like, you know, and no offense to any of those people, but you know how people just like sit and watch Netflix on the weekend? Like, that's just what they do, right? You know, that's it, right? You said, hey, I'm going to put down the remote for, for 10 minutes, 10 minutes, and I'm going to go do this other thing, right? I'm going to create something. If you are a create if you create something, whether you make money from it or not, you are by default an interesting person. You know, it's always the ones who have like, I have like a million followers, but I got nothing to share. I'm just, I'm just Sally from like the farm. Like, get out of here, Sally. You know, you got <laughs> stuff to share. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so Sally right now is just like unfriend now. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> So one of the things I wanted to talk about, because I know it's everyone's favorite question whenever you talk about anything, any direction you can take a food blog, everyone wants to know, how do you make money from this? Because at the root, that's what a lot of us are doing for food blogging. So when it comes to podcasting, how do you make money from podcasting? Oh, can someone tell me? Because right <laughs> now, I would tell you that um, if you would like to have a full-time second job that you pay for, a podcast is a great way to start. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, would someone tell me? I, I am just now beginning to like get offers to make money, but that's like I'm on season five, right? Like, and and in actuality, like this is two years later. So I would tell you that. Um, for people, so uh, there's two types of people, right? If you already have a food blog and you are looking to start a podcast, a podcast is an amazing way to create more content for your blog and for your overall business. Because really what we are as food bloggers is we're content creators. That's, that's the business model. And so if you are looking to create more content, a podcast is a very effective way to do that because you have the transcripts from the podcast, you can repurpose that into blog posts. You can use that to make an ebook. Um, you could interview people about a subject that you want to write a book about, right? You could, I mean, there's just so many ways to repurpose that content. All so the snippets that, and stuff on social media. All the snippets, social media, you know, another way to drive people to your blog because you can put it up on YouTube and all the different, you know, podcast things. Um, but that comes at a cost, right, for time. And also, uh, you have to, you have to be passionate about doing it. If you're the type of person who I always tell people, someone asked me, Hey, you know, like, should I start a podcast? And, and I'll come back to it in a moment. And I ask them a couple of questions that will tell me if they're really going to do well on the podcast. So if you're a person who's just starting out though, you have no block, right? So this, this is a great content maker. And if it, you know, it would take a while to make money. That's the, 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 the premise of them both. If you don't have a blog, if you are like me and you're just like, I just want to talk, talk, talk about food, right? It's going to take you a couple of years. There's no overnight success, right? I will tell you that I have a lot bigger numbers than when I started. I'm surprised at my numbers. 
I still haven't made any money. I have a full-time job that I work. And just like any business, right, it takes a couple of years to make any money. So, but let's talk about some ways you could make money and in ways that I'm pursuing, you know, funding for this, you know, super hobby that has <laughs> somehow turned into a side business at some point. Um, is the first way is sponsorships. And when you're small, people are like, well, you know, you have to get a certain number, set of numbers. Uh, not necessarily. I'll admit partially is that because I have this full-time military career, I haven't spent as much time pursuing sponsors. Probably if I did, I probably would get some sponsors at now because I've proven that I'm serious. Season five, I think season five says you're pretty serious, right? A company that's looking for a niche um, audience um, will will consider sponsoring you because they're reaching people who they, you know, they're reaching a very targeted audience. I mean, I really focus on food bloggers and, and chefs. So I have a very targeted audience and I can describe that audience to them. So the first thing is, is don't be afraid to reach out to those companies that you think would fit into your branded niche. They probably, you know, companies are busy. It's not because they don't want to spend money and advertise to your audience is that they may not know about you because you may not be showing up yet in Google. I'm surprised by how many people tell me they find me through Google. Several companies have found me that way. They were just looking for a food podcast and boop, here I went. So <laughs> my SEO must be doing okay. And that's with a Squarespace website, y'all, which I was told from the beginning, don't use Squarespace. And I thought, well, Mark Marin uses Squarespace. So I'm going to use Squarespace. <laughs> I, you know, I just like, I, I try to use WordPress. It just doesn't, like, I can't be bothered. <laughs> it's just too hard for me. Maybe one day I'll switch to WordPress, but uh, my website works and I'm still found by people. So sponsorships, whether they reach you, I think that's a, the best way a podcast can start making money. Um, another way is you could use Patreon. So you could do special episodes and then put them behind the Patreon power um, paywall and then ask your fans to fund, you know, like, hey, if you want to listen to this podcast, it's like five bucks, right? And it's a special episode where maybe you go all into a certain topic. Like, for example, if you were going to start a podcast, I would tell you, hey, Maybe you could do a five series episode on how to get started in sous vide. Like, no kidding. Like, walk people through it. And it's like the cost of it is 20 bucks. That's another way you can. You could sell, like, podcast courses. And then, of course, there's just straight up advertising with MediaVein. I don't know a whole lot about that. I don't think a lot of podcasters use that. They tend to use other podcast advertising networks. But I will say there are ways to make money in podcasting. I don't want to pretend like, you know, I'm made any money. I haven't, but I think I will in the future. How much? I'll come back on the show and tell you how much. Like, I got no problems being like, I made $45. I did get a set of free knives. <laughs> Winning? Like, yeah. I got a set of free knives for, for in, ex in exchange for, for doing some reviews about them. Uh, and I, I didn't have to do like a review that wasn't honest. I showed you right how I was using it, but those are pretty nice knives. So I made what those knives are probably worth $200. I made $200 in knives. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. I think like a lot of things around food blogging and business in general, it's, you need to know what your goals are going into something. And if your goal is to monetize a podcast and make a lot of money off of it, it's going to be a very specific direction you need to go in. And if your goal is to expand your network, it's very easy to accomplish with a podcast. You know, that's something that that's why I started one for Make and Bacon, because I wanted to get to know other food bloggers, expand my brand in the food blogging world. I wasn't very, despite being in it for 10 years, I was just getting started really networking with people. And I get to have amazing people, you know, on the show that I get to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with and I'm not asking them for anything really. And it's, we can meet as peers. So now when I go to a conference, I can go up to people like Jenny Melrose and Nicole and Sally Eckes and say, Hey, and they're like, Oh, it's great to see you again. And it expanded my network, but I'm not making any money off of this, but it's getting me closer to the goal that I was trying to accomplish.
Yes. I, so, so when people ask me for, so, so these are the questions I get asked about podcasts. The first question is how do I start a podcast? Right. And I'm like, you, you need, you need five things. Right. And we can go into that later. The second question is, uh, do you think I would be good at a podcast? And I'm like, Mm, I don't know. Like, <laughs> let me ask you some questions. And, and the third thing is like, why, you know, if you're not making money, why do you, why do you keep doing it? So I'll, I'll answer the second two questions first. Um, would you be good at starting a podcast? Do you like to talk? Cause that's like, you know, especially an audio podcast. That's kind of how it is. If you're a person who doesn't like to talk, you can still do one. It's going to come, it's going to be more difficult for you because that's not your natural inclination is to chat like all you have on a podcast is your voice and chat 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 in a way and if you aren't a person who's naturally chatty it's going to be tough because you can't have a whole lot of silence it does not say that's impossible in fact i think people who want to get better at conversing and chatting a podcast is an amazing way to force yourself to do that it forces you to talk to other people and to not just go, uh, you know, you can't look at your phone. You know, whenever I see people go to parties and people are like, I never meet anybody, right? I don't make any friends. And I'm like, yeah, because you look at your phone the whole time. Like, no one's engaging you because they think you're busy. Like, I don't know, launching mortars into a, letting mortars into a war zone because you're on your phone the whole time. Like, what are you doing? Get off your phone. Look up, smile, be approachable, and people will approach you. A podcast forces you to do that in a very safe environment because if it's terrible, you don't have to air it, right? You you don't have to air it. If you, I practiced before I put out my first episode because even I knew that naturally chatty Nicole was not polished enough to be on the air yet. So a podcast is a wonderful way to break through some social anxiety. The second thing I asked them is... I, I would say talk- really quick too that if, if a podcast is something you want to do and you are an introvert or you're like if you hate talking it's one thing but if you are an introvert like i'm introverted i generally especially five years ago wasn't comfortable having one-on-one conversations like i was okay like i wasn't Mm -hmm. you know too bad but it wasn't something that i enjoyed i didn't go like going to conferences i didn't enjoy any of the networking and it's something i've really worked on over the last five years and it's like it's still not something i love but i enjoy you know, hosting a podcast like this. And mm-hmm. when this is done, I will have had my social interaction for the day and don't don't need to see and another person or talk exactly. anymore. Exactly. You're like, I'm good, right? But it, it's helpful. And also it helps you to realize, oh, I can be an interesting person. I can ask good questions. And it, it helped, I, I think podcasts are great for introverts to, to help them break through uh, uh, that feeling of like, I don't know what to say because when you're interviewing somebody, all you have to do is ask a bunch of questions. You don't talk about yourself. You know, you can, I'm, I am naturally extroverted, but doing a podcast has helped me to listen more because you have to listen in order to, to do a great interview. You must listen so that you can pick up on those interesting things. Someone said, you know, when you have a normal conversation, generally I'm just waiting to talk more like, but but in an interview, you can't you can't do that. And it has forced me to learn to listen better. And it's made me a better conversationalist in real life. So uh, there are benefits to it. So just because you don't like to talk, if you want to do the podcast, you should. And the second thing is, is do you have a topic that you're passionate about? It doesn't have to be food. Uh, it, it can be on the most random thing as long as it's, you know, focused and you like talking about it or you like thinking about it or you have a lot of thoughts about it. So that's when people ask me like, well, I don't really like to talk. And I'm like, do you not like to talk? Or is it just that you get nervous and you think you don't have anything interesting to share? And that goes back to what was that? Like everybody has something interesting to share. So yeah, it, shout out. If there's anyone who wants to do a podcast, I love this show, Psych. I have wanted to do a rewatch podcast on that show forever where we just watch every episode of psych and we talk about it i love that show i could talk about it for hours that's a that's a podcast somebody steal that idea like <laughs> we're, we're in season three right now of our rewatch cause... yeah i love it I, you know i think season three is the best season of psych but side note see what i'm saying right yeah. there's a podcast right somebody steal that idea yes, uh, you please can't steal have that. that i will watch i will listen to and that's another thing about podcasts people think well there's so many podcasts out there why should i start my podcast there's too many no there, are there too many food blogs are there too many books like are there too many you know, it's like are there too many tv shows 
maybe. No, no, there's not. <laughs> there's not. It's not a zero sum game. If I like TV shows, um, you know, about dragons, okay, I'm not going to just watch one TV show about dragons. I'm going to watch all the TV shows about dragons. If I like murder mysteries, I'm not going to read one. I'm going to read them all. So, every, you know, every, everybody thinks like, oh, content is a zero sum game. It's not. Like, there is always room for more content. I mean, look at Binging with Babish, right? It's just some dude who was like trying to get over a heartbreak and decided to like just start, you know, cooking and making content for himself, right? He didn't realize he's going to blow up. He's just making content that he liked to make. And it's a zero sum game. You don't have to, you know, I have a podcast, you can have a podcast. Like that's just more people to interview. That's just more cross connection. And in fact, I tell people when you start a podcast, look for other podcasters like you. One, you'll know if your topic is a viable topic. You want a lot of people in that topic. And two, that's other people to emulate. That's other people to chat with. I, I don't know. Anyone who's ever asked me about being on their podcast or who's asked me about starting a podcast, I'm not like, no, got to keep all my secrets to myself. <laughs> no, I'm like, give it all this away for free because we all rise. When podcasts are popular, all of the podcasts rise. Like TV is not just like, I just want to remember when there was just like three, three, uh, channels of tv i do that's how old i am <laughs> like it was terrible <laughs> you know all you watched was mash and i used to think i can't wait for the day when there's more than just mash on tv and i'm in the military now right you know now it's incredible i can watch exactly what i want and i can watch the kind of niche that i want and i can listen to the things that i want so if you think that there's too many podcasts you're wrong there's not enough let's get more out there there's there cream rises to the top and you don't know that you're cream unless you try. So you should, you should, you should do it. Do it. Start your podcast. So someone heard that and they say, great, I'm going to do this. They understand how a conversation works. You know, we've all had conversations and everyone right now is currently listening to a podcast. So we understand how to listen to a podcast. What happens in between a conversation to make it a downloadable podcast that you can now listen on your phone? What is that process from a high level? Oh man. So I'll walk you through my process. So, you know, you and I, let's say this is my, my podcast, which you were on and we'll be out here in a couple of weeks. Um, so I take that audio file and I like, I, I am a big stickler on audio, um, because I feel like if they can't see me, then all they have is my voice. So it better sound good, especially as the host. So I take that and I have a company that I use. So in the beginning, I, I want to, let me talk to you about people in the beginning, because now I've like decided that it is worth my time to use an editor to, to, to help me edit this podcast. But in the beginning, I was doing it myself and it was hours of work because I was new, <clears throat> excuse me, I was new to it. I, um, and I would tell people that like, there's a cost factor involved with your time when you start anything new, right? Like when you first learned to cook, it was, it was, it was hard, right? It wasn't, you didn't get it right. Like, you know, you burned a lot of things. It was the whole thing. It's the same with podcasts, right? When I first started, I had to like learn how to edit a podcast and learn how to record a podcast and, you know, figure out what mic I wanted to get. And, oh, by the way, you don't need to get a super expensive mic. Like if you're spending more than a hundred dollars on a mic, it's probably too much in the beginning. You know, you need to find out, am I going to stick with this? That's the biggest thing. Are you going to stick with it? So I get it out of, you know, I have it in my computer and then I would edit it in Adobe. Oh gosh. Audition. Yeah. Adobe audition. Um, and like I said, I would listen to the whole thing and then I would make notes on what sections I wanted to cut out or what sections sounded too tinny or what, sec you know, if somebody coughed or if somebody like, you know, they, they rambled on for too long, which is what I tend to do. Or I, it's mostly me, me, as we was talking about rambling too long. And I would make the cuts like I would put like they, they're like little markers. I would make the cuts on where I'd want to to cut out that audio. And then you just start cutting and shoving it together. Um, and if you listen in the beginning, you know, you might be able to see like where I was like cutting things and I didn't have like a super smooth transition. And you just learn that over time through thousands of YouTube videos. 
or you get like me and you get frustrated and hire somebody to do it for you. Um, and that was, like I said, that was some money after it's all cut together. Then I have a routine intro, um, that you put in the beginning that fades in. And then I have like, when the interview is done, I have like a timer so that, you know, interview's done. Right. And then I do what I call my summation and that's separately. So after I've listened to the episode, I write a summation based on what the episode was. In the beginning, this used to be in a really apologetic summation, like, oh, I made this mistake here and sorry about that because I thought people were just going to call me on that. Turns out people don't care. Like, I don't even, I don't even bother to, to point out my mistakes anymore because people will forgive you because you're their friend on on the radio, you know, you'll forgive a lot of things. So I would tell people one of the mistakes I made was constantly pointing out all my mistakes and apologizing. You know, nobody cares. <laughs> like it's free content. Like <laughs> they don't expect perfection. So they probably didn't even and they're not making a happen. recipe or something. Yeah, that is, they're, they're going to ruin their dinner. No, they're just listening to you while they're trying to chase a toddler and you know stop that toddler from killing itself for the fifteenth time that day. They're not going to worry about it. you. Actually, said I used to make up words. I think I made up a word that was like uh, it's a tragedy. That's not a word, Jason. Right? <laughs> I said that, and I was like, oh god, that's so stupid. But nobody else cared, and they thought it was funny. So. I finished a summation, then I smash it all together into that program, which I'm making it sound really easy. It takes a while to learn it, so don't be intimidated. If you first start and you're like, oh man, this is tough. Yeah, it's tough. Like, <laughs> you ever edit video? That's tough too, um, but you learn. That's why YouTube exists. Like, it's a million YouTube, YouTube tutorials that can help you with that. Or some, there's some, there's even now new podcasts, I guess, software that will help you do this a lot easier. And then I'd export it into a MP3 file. Um, and then I put it up, like I, I had a schedule. I recommend for people, if you're gonna start a podcast, you need to have like a schedule. Like, are you gonna be a season? Are you gonna be weekly? Are you gonna be bi-weekly? Are you gonna be monthly? I think the minimum for a podcast is you have to be at least every two weeks because people need to be able to expect you to show up like on their phones or, you know, in their YouTube queue, because if you don't, then it's too, like, I think a month is too long unless you're doing something like there's a guy who does this, he does this uh, podcast. It's called lessons of, from a screenplay. And these are video podcasts and they're very intensive. Like it probably takes him two weeks to make one. He's probably putting one out once a month, but those are like 10 minute long and they're cuts from like the movie and, it's got a lot of like graphic intensive. So I understand that. But generally for an audio podcast, you want to try to be weekly or bi-weekly so that people remember you and you grow in a relationship with them. So I put it out on every Thursday. I used to do Wednesday. I found that I was competing too hard with too many other podcasts. Thursday was better. Also, I needed that extra day to like, you know, screw up. So I put it out on Thursday. <laughs> I put it, it's early. I put it out on Thursday morning and that's just like, and, and how I put it out is I host on Libsyn, which is a podcast host. So you can't just like throw your podcast out to the world. You have to, like a website, you have to host that data somewhere and it's hosted for me on Libsyn. I think that they're the most, they're the most established. They're the cheapest in the business and they are pretty, they know what they're doing. They've been around since this started. So I trust Libsyn. I've not had any problems with them. Um, and I think they, they get the job done and it's not that expensive. It's around 20 bucks a month to host with them. And so I could afford that, like, you know, it's $20. It's like three lot. that's three lattes maybe now. So yeah, that's worth it for me. Um, and that's how I put out the podcast. Now I didn't talk to you cause I don't want to bore everyone to death about the sheer amount of like other work that goes into it, like the marketing, um, or I, I try to create a marketing email for my guests so that it's easy for them. So the number one rule is if you have guests, it should be so easy for them to be on your podcast that it's a no brainer. So when I approach a guest, when I book them, when I get them ready for the podcast, I try really hard to explain everything so that all they have to do is jump onto Skype. And I use Skype. I've tried all the podcast ones. To me, Skype with the um, recorder, the Skype recorder 
is by far the easiest and the cheapest way to do it. And I was going to go Gucci, right? I would pay for a more Gucci solution, but there is none. Skype is the best. It's it's the most reliable. I've had other software that's failed me seven times. And I'm just like, I won't put a guess through that. So I, I use try Skype to, for all my stuff too when I can as well. Yeah, but it's the same it's reasons. The standard. It's the standard and it's fine. So I have a marketing email that I put together for the guests so they can help share the episode. Then I post to Instagram. I used to post every day to Instagram and I found that the algorithm doesn't like it. It actually likes it when you only post a couple times a week. Nice. You learn that through trial and error. A lot of me starting a podcast was trial and error. It was me teaching myself things or learning things on the fly. And there is something like, even if I never make any money from this, there is something valuable about learning to do this because I learned about how to market myself and how to build a brand and how to produce content on a, a weekly basis and how to deliver results, like how to, no kidding, and then how to evaluate like, okay, this week I didn't have as many listens. Why was that? Or wow, what happened this week? I had like people shot up, what, what caused that? And so just those lessons alone have taught, they've helped me in my regular job because I do this, you know, I do PR for a living. And so learning how to create and start a brand, man, that's been super valuable. I mean, if nothing else, like I one day will have to leave the military. And now I have this portfolio of work that I've created for myself that shows, hey, I know how to like build a brand. Like I can be a brand manager. Look, I built this brand. Like, see, and here's all my numbers, and here's how you know I marketed it, and here's all the streams of revenue that I tried to produce, and here's all the different channels that I was able to put myself into. And you know, whether you're trying to make your food blog your your thing for life, or whether you decide at some point, you know what, I had a lot of fun, I'm good. That's still a marketable skill you've taught yourself. So. Yeah worth it. Yeah, I think it's great knowing how many different outcomes come from whether it's podcasting or learning YouTube or these different skills that we think of, you know, we get so focused in our food blogger mindset of like, well, how am I going to, you know, sell cookbooks or sell ads or make more money from this directly? But it can be very great for just life skills and for things moving beyond. Like if you are start a successful podcast, even if you don't have huge listeners, but the brands like you, I mean, there's no reason that like a Bob's Red Mill might not go, hey, we've been thinking about doing a podcast. Mm -hmm. You've had us on your podcast twice and interviewed us because you, you know, write about or talk about food. Do you want to come be our head podcaster? Like there's a lot mm -hmm. of kind of exit right. strategies that you can have. Right. You know, I think like a lot of people, you know, you think about all the, all the, all the moms out there or all the people who started a food blog and maybe they haven't been in the workforce for a while and this is what they started their food blog. Um, you know, uh, everybody won't be a monster, you know, success, right? But there can success can be found. But like, this is another way to build. Like, I wasn't just like, you know, although I think like, I think everyone has realized now staying home with your kids like is the hardest job in the world now <laughs> I, I would I think I want to see a meme where stay-at-home moms are like oh you had to stay at home and clean the house and you know homeschool your kids <laughs> hard right you know, <laughs> you know stay-at-home moms are like they're the only ones winning during this pandemic because we all realize oh my gosh <laughs> yep. teachers deserve way more money stay-at-home moms deserve way more credit <laughs> but like maybe you're looking to get back into the workforce this is a way to like show like I wasn't, you know, I wasn't fooling around. Like I built a brand. I know how to do these skill sets. Like I'm not, you know, I'm skilled at managing, you know, an, a brand that I built from the ground up. And so, you know, there's many reasons to start a podcast or a blog more than just I'm going to, you know, make money from this. I, I think it's a great portfolio piece for anybody. One of the things you mentioned before that I wanted to touch on again while we're wrapping up is how do you find guests for your podcast? You mentioned it briefly and I've heard you talk about it before, but it's it can be very nerve wracking to try to find someone to come on to interview. I'll tell you, um, generally, so when I first started looking for guests, I was a member of Food Blogger Pro and I 
was terrified, I asked the moderator, hey, is it okay if I post looking for guests for my podcast? I always think people are going to say no. I'm surprised at how many times people don't say no. They're like, yeah, no, that's fine, right? So she's like, sure, it's not a big deal. So I posted, hey, I'm looking for guests for my podcast. And, you know, the first guy who, who reached out was a guy named Ben from uh, Ramshackle Patry. And uh, he, what a lovely person, by the way. He's so, he's so funny and, and he was my first guest and I will always be grateful to him, you know, because he was like, sure, I'd, I'd love to be on your podcast. I mean, he's my very first guest. So I made a bunch of mistakes with him, but he was fantastic and such a sweet, sweet person, Ben Meyer from, um, from a Ramshackle, Ramshackle Pantry. I can't promote him enough because he was wonderful. Uh, and so I found guests, people were like, yeah, I'd love to be on your podcast. And so I had a little bit of criteria, not because I wanted to be a snob, but because I wanted to make sure I was getting guests who, who were ready to do this. Um, so I put on a criteria if you had to have a blog for at least a year, or you needed to work in the food industry currently. And, um, that allowed me to eliminate people who, you know, look like myself who had started a blog for five minutes, you know, and wanted to talk about my four recipes, right? And then wasn't gonna continue on because I wanted people who were still blogging when you went to those podcast episodes later on the line, like Ben's still doing his thing. Like most of my guests are still blogging and, and working in the food industry. Um, and also it shows me that you're serious, like you're serious about committing. Cause I was serious. I was gonna commit for one year to do the podcast, no matter what, and that's two years later. So there you go. Um, <laughs> so that's the only criteria I put on it. But in the beginning, so I tell people when you start your podcast and you're small and you think, am I going to get Chrissy Teigen? Like, no, probably not. Right. And that's okay. You don't want Chrissy Teigen. And the reason is, is because she's too big for you. Right. You would be too nervous. Like you would not be able, you would freak out because you can't make all your, although I think Chrissy Teigen would be a wonderful guest and she would be super gracious, right? She's a big fish. You don't want to start with a big fish, right? You want to start with people who are on your level so you're comfortable, so you gain your skill set. Oprah was not Oprah in the beginning, right? She was a local news reporter and she was interviewing people for the local news. She only became Oprah after she had done it for 10 years before she moved on to start her own talk show. It took her a long time. Like she didn't start up. No one, you know, started out like Mark Marin wasn't Mark Marin in the beginning. Right. And he's done like, I think he's done over like, gosh, I want to say three, 400 episodes. Right. That's a lot, but it started small and he didn't start out with super major guests. Um, Joe Rogan didn't start out as Joe Rogan. He was just a comic and he decided to start a podcast and he interviewed a lot of people and he made a lot of mistakes. So the, the reason I say all that is start small, you know, like if there's a guest who she's had a podcast for, maybe she's only had a blog for a year. That's a great person to interview. And I've actually, those are my favorite type of people to interview because they're so excited still about their, their blog and they're excited to talk about food and they're honored that somebody has asked them about their opinion. Those are great guests. Um, I have found that if you aren't getting enough no's, you haven't asked big enough people after a certain point. Someone told me that, like, if you keep getting all yeses, that means you haven't stretched yourself far enough to ask people. And I still don't get no. I've never gotten a no, Jason. I just haven't gotten a call back or I didn't get an email back, right? And that's a no, right? Yep. <laughs> and it may not be, like, I'll give you an example. I just interviewed um, Nicole Trebe. Um, she's Windy, C Windy City Dinner Fairy. I hope I'm saying her name right. And she's wonderful and she's big. She's a big time food stylist. And uh, the first time I reached out to her, I didn't hear anything back from her. Turns out she was pregnant in the middle of having a baby, right? That's why it was a no, right? <laughs> I reached out to her a couple months later at the, at the uh, encouragement of another food blogger and she said yes. That was a big get for me, right? I've been following her for a year. Sometimes it's a no right now. Um, but it's not a no forever. And sometimes it's just a no because I'm busy. You don't know. But don't take that rejection as, oh, I'm just a small. Like, content is content. 
I'm one day going to ask Chrissy Teigen to be on my podcast, right? I'm going to do it because she's amazing. And she probably would say yes. I'm not ready for Chrissy Teigen yet, but I will be, right? Or, or, or for any of the other, you know, major food names out there. You can start small and build yourself up. Oprah wasn't Oprah when she started. She was just a news reporter honing her skills. And so I tell people, don't be afraid to ask. I've gone to food blog. I've, I've asked in everything food conference. I've, I've go, you know, the second thing I would tell you is go where you're, go where the people you want to interview are. I want to interview chefs. I want to interview food bloggers. So where do chefs and food bloggers hang out? Instagram. Uh, they hang out on, uh, they don't really hang out on Twitter that much, but they're on Instagram a lot. They're in, you know, Facebook forums uh, about food and food blogging. And I put out a, a request. Hey, I'm looking for this type of person. If you're interested in, in being interviewed, reach out to me. And people do. I have a person who has a publicist and a team reached out to me like several times. Like people who've been on the Food Network have reached out to me. I mean, uh, and, and asked me to interview their person because they're always looking for places to interview people. That's one good thing about podcasts is that when you're when you're hosting something and you're interviewing people, you're doing them a favor in a way because you're media. So people are always trying to get media to, to interview their people because that's content. It lives on the web. They'll more than likely say yes. And even if it's not a yes right now, it's like, yes, hit me up in six months when my book comes out. Do that and, and you will get guests. I've never had an outright... Uh, who are you and what is your show and what do you want to do? Never, <laughs> never. Because people, they're, they're, they're honored when you reach out to them. I didn't realize that. But you think you're not a big deal. And people are like, oh, me? You would like to talk to me? Yes, I would like to talk to you. And then they're excited. Especially when you're enthusiastic, you know, and you're excited about them. Yeah. I, I think it's very important, like you said, to start out small because you – you are learning no matter how much you practice ahead of time. The first time you're in a live interview with somebody, it's very different. My first two interviews were my mom and my dad. And then my next three were my like best friend, like my best blogging friends came on and I interviewed them. And they were all people that I was so nervous. I was, you know, stressed out the whole time. And these are people that I could have done nothing and they would have been like, oh, that was fun. You know, like mm -hmm. there was zero pressure and I was still a nervous wreck. And so mm -hmm. getting through those nerves of just doing something you've never done before and then you can move on. And if you had Chrissy Teigen on, you'd be nervous about Chrissy Teigen, but you wouldn't be nervous about your sound or your audio or any of the other things around it because you've already done that, you know, 40, 50, 60 times. Like you can exactly. stress out about that and just fall back into what you know. It's like for all the exactly. food bloggers out there, if you're stressed when you're cooking, it's probably not a big deal if it's a recipe you've done before because it's like stress, but I know what I'm doing now and you can just mm -hmm. focus on getting it done. Yeah, I mean, now I'm on season five, right? I can just, I can easily like rip off, like like I, I can do it, I can easily pull off an interview um, a lot faster and a lot easier. And if something goes wrong, I know how to recover because it's happened to me before. I mean, I've had interviews where I did the whole interview and the, the, the file corrupted and I just felt like, Oh God, I'm never going to get over this. And you know, I've, I've gone through those hard knocks. I, I think the only way to learn is you got to do like you got it. You must do, you must like create because when you create and you make mistakes, then you learn from them. It sounds so cheesy, but it's really true that on the only way to learn is to do. I think that's a great thing to end the podcast on. I think um, you had a, a lot of great information. You have so much experience in podcasting. I had a blast when I came on yours. So it's nice to turn the tables and put you through the ringer a little bit, force you to try to open up and talk a little bit, which I know is against your nature. But I thank know, you. right? <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming on and sharing so much. If people want to get a hold of you, they can check out your podcast or uh, your website, the bffwiththechef.com. You have a mm -hmm. lot of great content on there and some amazing episodes. So thank you so much for coming on Make and Bacon. Uh, thank you so much for having me today, Jason. And thanks everybody out there. And just remember, you can do this. Don't be afraid. Mama, 
Schweggs is right here to help you. So <laughs> feel free to reach out if you have questions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Bye. This has been Making Bacon, all about helping you serve your fans, grow your income, and get the most out of your blog. Till next time, I'm Jason Logston. Like many of the things you can do while you're blogging, podcasts can open up some new doors for you. And this video is going to show you how you can take advantage of all those opportunities.